Hello everyone and welcome to the latest of Field Fisher's Privacy webinar series. Today we are covering EU enforcement trends. My name is Hazel Grant and I am the Head of Data Privacy based out of our London office. So thank you for joining us today. I'm joined by my colleagues from around our European offices and in a few moments when they speak I will ask them to introduce themselves. First, let's briefly dis um, discuss our topic. Uh, the GDPR is well into its third year of being. And so we wanted to focus on how the GDPR has actually been enforced. I think we all saw a relatively slow start to enforcement actions, no doubt in some cases due to the fact that supervisory authorities had to collect evidence of breaches post the 28th of May, 2018. But we're now all seeing regular updates on GDPR enforcement. And because this has spread across the EU, we, start to, we can start to look at trends in different jurisdictions. I'm going to ask each of my colleagues to speak for around five minutes, and we're going to cover Belgium, UK, Ireland, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands. So we do have quite a lot to get through. For those, of us, uh, for those of you who don't already know us, Field Fisher is an international law firm with offices around Europe, in Silicon Valley and in China. Our privacy team works across all of those offices. We are a collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions. And I know you're going to hear evidence of that in this webinar. So turning to housekeeping, please do ask us questions using the question function on the screen. We're going to try and take them at convenient points during the webinar, so do keep them coming along. There will also be some time at the end for questions. If we run out of time on questions, we will respond to the questions posed in writing, and we will finish at 5 p.m. UK. Later this week, we will send you a copy of our slides and also a recording, so please don't feel that you have to scribble everything down as we go along. Finally, a couple of other points. Please do subscribe to our blog and keep an eye out for more of our webinars in the coming weeks and months. If you would like to take the Field Fisher Get DP Fit course, then subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll find details on this and the other webinars when we send you the slide deck and the recording. So that's enough for an introduction. Let's turn to our first country, which is Belgium, and my first colleague, which is Tim. Tim, over to you to take us through the position in Belgium. Thank you very much, Hazel. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim van Canet. I'm a partner in the Field Fisher Privacy Department in Belgium. I'll be very happy to update you on the state of enforcement in Belgium. Now, um, as you can see, data protection enforcement in Belgium has started very slowly, and I see two reasons for this. Um, first, the new board of directors of the Belgian DPA was actually only officially appointed in March 2019, uh, which was, well, quite late. Um, but secondly, um, the Belgian DPA did not have real enforcement powers before GDPR. So this was, and this still is, a very new power to them. Um, and so the, the first sanction, and that was not a surprise, the first sanction was only imposed in May 2019, one year after the GDPR came into effect. Now, over the months, the DPA, as it seems, has come to grip with its new powers and has started to enforce more actively. Um, it has conducted more than 100 inspections in the period May 2019 to May 2020. And also the number of enforcement decisions issued by the litigation chamber of the DPA is increasing. Um, throughout 2019, it adopted only 18 decisions. Um, in the first eight months of 2020, it has already um, issued 48 decisions. Um, now, looking at those decisions, a significant evolution is also the nature of those decisions. Um, in 2019, most of those decisions seem to deal with rather atypical issues, I would say. Um, there were several politicians that were fined over issues around elect electoral marketing, um, a couple of public authorities, but no real big corporations. Um, and that has changed in 2020. The DPA has sanctioned a number of large companies, um, for instance, a big telco, an insurance company, and actually also Google. Um, the other um, 
uh, evolution that we see is that um, the amount of the fines is also on the rise. Um, the very first fine that was issued was a mere 2,000 euros. Um, in more recent cases, the fines amounted uh, to 50,000 euros, and in the Google case, even to 600,000 euros. Now, I realize that um, I should probably not emphasize the even, because even though it's a substantial increase, that those fines are still fairly low compared to other member states. But um, it's quite clear that the tendency is to um, see an increase on those fines. Now, if we move to the next uh, slides, um, the big question is, of course, what to expect next? Um, and I think despite its rather small size, the Belgian DPA seems quite determined to play a prominent role in the area of GDPR enforcement. It has been recruiting in recent months and um, will likely become an even more active enforcer. Um, I think one interesting point of attention is the fact that currently 99% of all inspections result from a complaint filed by a data subject. Um, however, the Inspector General has recently announced that um, he wants to act in a more proactive manner by starting investigations on its own initiative. Um, and obviously, um, that will allow the DPA to focus more on the key focus points of its strategic plan, which you can see on the slide. So what we expect is that um, companies in the telco sector, the media sector, direct marketing sectors might be specifically targeted for investigations and inspections. The other thing that is worth noting uh, with regard to the strategic plan is that also the litigation chamber is following that very closely. A lot of the decisions have really focused on those topics that were identified as key priorities in the strategic plan. Um, you may recall a controversial decision on the independence of the data protection officer um, that was issued in, in May uh, this year. Um, which basically said that um, if if you are the head of a department, and in this particular case it was the head of compliance, head of audit, and head of um, risk, that you cannot also act as DPO because that creates a conflict of interest. There are also several decisions that have um, dealt with lawfulness, uh, issues around consent, legitimate interest, and um, the fundamental data protection principles. Um, so, so that is obviously, if you have a lot of um, operations in Belgium, um, it, it's really worth making sure that you are um, covered and that you're um, uh, operating com in a compliant way with regard to those topics. Then finally, um, for the next slides, um, a, a few um, thoughts on how we could summarize their, their approach. And I think the, summer, the, the approach can be summarized as follows. Um, move things forward as quickly as possible. Um, I think one might even argue that the Belgian DPA applies a quick and dirty approach. It's certainly something that I've heard um, from several of our clients and, and several um, organizations that have already been engaging, uh, had to engage with the DPA. Um, the investigation, the inspections currently, they're very light. Um, it's basically a paper investigation. You get a, a few questions that you need to reply to. So there's no on-site inspections yet. Um, they will come in in the future. Um, and there are no interrogations as, as such. So it's a very, very light um, investigation. Um, when the um, investigation is closed, the case is sent to the litigation chamber, and then you typically only get one month to file a submission. A hearing can be requested by the defendant, but it's not automatic, automatically granted. Um, and um, obviously, in, if at the end of uh, that proceeding, um, you, you get a sanction by the litigation chamber, um, it's worth noting that you have the right to appeal that decision. Um, you can appeal before the market court, which is um, a civil court. Um, and I think one interesting point there is that um, several decisions, several initial decisions of the uh, litigation chamber have been quashed by the market court. And at times, the, the market court was quite critical of the DPA. And personally, um, I believe that this is one of the reasons why the Belgian DPA has been issuing fines which are not too high. Um, it almost sounds or feels as if they want to reduce the chance that a defendant will appeal because the costs of the appeal don't outweigh the potential gain. Um, so, so I think, I mean, by way of conclusion, um, 
I think it's fair to say that before GDPR, the Belgian DPA was one of those toothless tigers that um, were that one was commonly referring to. Um, but today, it, it is really determined to enforce GDPR. And although the fines are not very high yet, or not high yet, um, I, I think it's clear that the Belgian DPA is becoming one of the more active enforcers in the EU. And with that um, said, uh, I think uh, I've covered the main the main topics with regard to to Belgium, and I'm handing over now to um, Alex Bertrand, who will update us on the latest developments in France. Thank you very much, Tim, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alex Bertrand. I am a French qualified associate working in the Fisher's privacy team, and in the short time that I have with you now, I will be giving you an update overview of the recent GDPR enforcement actions and trends in France. So in the year of 2019, the French Data Protection Authority, known as the CNIL, issued seven administrative fines amounting to over 51 million euros in total. Now, of course, um, this includes the 50 million euro fine that was issued against Google in January 2019. So what we have seen in 2019, at least, is that the CNIL has issued fines that were um, generally not above 500,000 euros, but it can definitely um, strike harder uh, against maybe in, in specific cases, such as the Google case. Um, in the most recent month, in the last uh, 12 months, the CNIL has issued six public decisions um, two of them were sanctions, and these sanctions are featured in the table that is presented in this slide. Um, the last sanction was issued um, at the end of July this year against a company called Spartu. And before that, it was the company Futura International that was um, fined 500,000 euros at the end of November 2019. Um, the CNIL also issued four formal notices in the last 12 months, which I will talk about in a minute. But before I do, I think it's important to highlight that although there were only six public decisions adopted in the last 12 months, these are only public decisions and the CNIL also issues a larger number of non-public decisions. So by way of comparison, uh, the CNIL has issued 42 formal notices in 2019, out of which only two were made public. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, this slide presents the four formal notices that were issued in the last 12 months. Um, two of them are presented in the same uh, line because they were very similar cases. These were the EDF and NG formal notices. What is most interesting to note, I think, is that out of these four cases, Two have already been closed by the CNIL. Uh, this concerns the, the formal notice against the Ministry of Solidarities and Health and the one against Boutique Aero. As in both cases, the CNIL found that the organization had successfully implemented the required corrective measures. So this also goes on to say that the CNIL is um, looking forward to organizations uh, being more and more compliant with the GDPR and will not necessarily um, and end up just finding organizations. Um, it will also try to accompany them into being um, more compliant. If we go on to the next slide, um, we can talk about the CNIL's enforcement strategy for 2020. So the CNIL has identified three priority enforcement areas for 2020. And these include um, the security of health data, and also anything relating to cookies and tracking technologies. Uh, the CNIL has changed its guidance regarding cookies and tracking, tracking technologies in 2019. It is still in the process of issuing more recommendations. So following um, these changes and after a six month grace period, the CNIL will be um, enforcing the new rules. And last, lastly, um, the CNIL has also said that it will look into geolocation data for mobility and transport purposes. Now, it has to be kept in mind that these priority enforcement areas will probably amount for about 20% of the formal investigations carried out by the CNIL. So that should be around 50 investigations, but there are also um, 
a lot of other areas that could be um, in, looked into by the CNIL. A number of investigations are already ongoing, such as the formal investigation against the ad tech company Critio, which was opened in January 2020. And also um, many complaints were also filed with the CNIL. And the CNIL has mentioned, um, in particular in its uh, uh, Charter of Controls that was published last week, that over 40% of the CNIL's in inspections are carried out following complaints. So um, complaints will also drive the CNIL's uh, enforcement activity. And so just as I was mentioning this point, uh, I would like to finish with the fact that the CNIL has published a Charter of Controls uh, document um, that, that stated August 2020. This document is helpful because it generally explains how the CNIL carries out its inspections. So I just wanted to mention it here, although of course uh, the CNIL is not specifically saying which areas it will be targeting next. Uh, with that said, I will now uh, leave it to my colleagues Felix Witten to present enforcement trends in Germany. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, my name is Felix Witter. I'm a partner of our uh, privacy team in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, when it comes to Germany, uh, there's always a lot to discuss. As you know, we have a federal system, we have 17 regula regulatory bodies, and they don't have a completely consistent approach to our sort of enforcement. But there's some things we do see which are basically the same uh, everywhere. Um, the first one is that we we've had quite a strict um, enforcement. Well, that we haven't had a strict enforcement in the past, and more of a cooperative approach. Although um, many think it's strict, but it's not been very strict on enforce on the enforcement level. And that is changing now, and the regulators are starting to make full use of the enforcement tools that they have, and that includes several cases of quite significant hefty fines. It has been so far quite case-driven, not a strategic approach towards uh, how to enforce, but basically on the case-by-case -case basis, we've seen certain issues or uh, topics raised uh, as they came up. And we also see it's more formal than it has been before. So the, the entire style is slightly changing uh, towards more formalities. And maybe by going through some of those examples, I can give you a feeling for how things are approached uh, when it comes to uh, enforcement. It started off with Delivery Hero about a, a year ago, where, where there were tw uh, about 20 subject rights requests which had not been responded to correctly and the data was kept too long and that led to uh, almost 200,000 uh, euro fine. So not a huge case, but actually quite a significant fine. Deutsche Wohnen was even more scary to a certain degree. Um, Deutsche Wohnen uh, didn't delete the data the way they should have deleted it and were actually a not able to delete data uh, when they wanted to. And so that led to 15 million euro fine, including a increase of the fine because it did not cooperate as much as it should have. And, and the regulator said that had an impact on the fine. So that's maybe also a word of warning. Uh, if you receive anything from German regulators, it could be a good idea to cooperate and not to try and gut, uh, duck away and cover. Deutsche Telekom had a 10 million euro fine over um, their treatment well, over their authentication when you dialed into their customer care center. So the technical and organization measures were held to be not correct because you uh, customers could dial in and just authenticate while giving their name and date of birth and nothing in addition. And that alone led to a fine of 10 million euros. So you can see there's a consistency over if they fine, they fine quite high. And if we get to the next side, slide, we'll see another one that has been quite recent. Um, uh, so uh, that's for health insurance. They didn't provide sufficient training to their marketing team. The marketing team send out emails um, and they shouldn't have sent those emails uh, in 500 cases. That led to 1.2 million euro fines just for not you know, working with the correct consent. And actually the regulator also said the fine was lowered because it's the corona time and health insurances are under such stress. So they uh, said they would have uh, liked to fine higher. 
Uh, so you can see, as I said, there are a lot of uh, those higher cases. There are a lot of smaller cases as well. One extra I'd like to mention is that Rapid Data, a small company, was fined 10,000 euro just not for having for not having a data protection officer in place. So if we look at the next next slide, at the current uh, the next or what we're predicting as enforcement trends. The first one is around TREMS 2. So we're already seeing that the regulators are um, applying TREMS 2 to existing cases. They are expecting anyone that they're at this time dealing with and that have international data transfer to um, have a response to what they're doing with TREMS 2 and to give them a uh, well feedback on how they think this, uh, how the companies think they, they would be ha handling this uh, while the regulators are still learning. But they're quite advanced in saying, yes, we want to know what you're doing and we expect you as a company to have implemented uh, supplemental measures where necessary um, or at least to work on it and show us what you're doing. So that's, and they also said, we will enforce about it around it. We will start doing this. Uh, in a couple of months, but it's already applicable, so you have to be there anyways and have to have responses. The second one is around cookies, and yes, we will see, hear more in, uh, about those. They said uh, there, there will be questionnaires going out or that, that have already gone out. They're reviewing cookies. And the third one uh, that we're seeing as a, a prediction is that we'll hear more about uh, questionnaires that are sent out and um, an overall uh, check of the quality of the uh, implementation of privacy solutions in companies. So we'll see more of those questionnaires and, and uh, that's something to be prepared for because that, those come with not a, too much of a deadline. Um, one more thing I'd like to point at is that there is, if you're interested in the in fines or how those are calculated, there's a model that the regulators have put out um, saying this is how fines should be calculated and they give you a formula, uh, so to speak, on um, how they uh, calculate fines. So far, the fines have all not been in the higher level that's possible, as they always point out. But the formula itself allows to use the entire level, and um, that's basically an, a, sort of an agreed uh, approach, um, with which shows that they're heavily relying on the turnover of a company to calculate the fines, and um, uh, that the severity of the breach actually hasn't been that significant uh, when you look at what they're. Uh, what they want to apply in this formula. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Julie Austin in Ireland. Thanks, Felix. So, hello everyone, my name is Julie Austin and I'm a partner in Field Fisher's Dublin office and I lead our privacy offering here in Ireland. And I'm going to give you a five minute overview of enforcement action in Ireland. Although I think Max Schrems might argue I don't need five minutes given the very slow pace of the DPC investigations in Ireland to, to date. Um, and in fact, some of you might have seen in May of this year that he actually described the Irish regime as highly inefficient and Kafka-esque. So uh, we look at what the DPC has been up to over the last few years and see whether Mr. Schrems is, is right on that. So looking at our next slide, the, the DPC in June of this year quite helpfully issued a regulatory activity report, which is very much a showcase of the DPC's activity over the last two years. Um, and this activity report is very much going to inform the DPC's regulatory approach for the next five years. So if you are um, interested in the Irish um, position, it is an extremely informative document and a very worthwhile read. Um, so I'm just going to go back one slide. Chloe, oh, sorry. The, the, there's a slide missing. I'll bring it through. Uh, I'll go through it with you um, e e verbally. So in, in that regulatory activity report, and the slides will be circulated following um, the session today, it gives some of key figures and facts in relation to the activities of the DPC. So we have 12, over 12,000 breach notifications that have been made to the DPC over the last two years, and 94% of those breach notifications have been closed. We've also had 746 complaints from 
peer um, data protection authorities. We've also had 24 mutual assistant requests. We've had 282 direct marketing complaints and 11 of those complaints have actually been prosecuted in the courts in Ireland. We've seen 66 law enforcement directive complaints um, we've also had 53 national statutory inquiries. So there's formal statutory inquiries that have been in, instigated on foot of complaints. And interestingly enough, most of those 53 inquiries are in the public sector as opposed to in the private sector. They largely relate to issues regarding data breaches or state surveillance or the legal basis for processing or the independence of data protection officers. Um, and then separately, we've had 24 cross-border statutory inquiries into the multinational tech sector. Uh, and as many of you will know, the Irish DPC is the regulator for many of the large global tech companies. So it has been keeping very busy with inquiries into very complicated and complex privacy issues, such as issues in the ad tech sector or um, issues such as delisting. So I've included in, in the, this slide and the, the following slide, some of the information regarding those 24 statutory inquiries into the tech sector. And I've also set out in those slides the, the current status of each of those inquiries. Most of them are at a very early stage, I should say, but we should see some decisions coming out soon. So you'll see on this page, for example, Google have two inquiries ongoing at the moment um, in the DPC, um, one in relation to lawful processing and one in relation to transparency and data minimization. I won't go through each of the 24 inquiries, but I have included details on the slides should you wish to review those in your own time. So moving on to the next slide, in terms of fines that have been issued by the DPC in Ireland, the first fine that has been issued was only issued in April 2020, so April this year, so we were quite slow to issue a fine in Ireland, and that was a fine against TUSLA. TUSLA is our child protection agency in Ireland. Um, they investigate allegations of child abuse. Um, they received a fine in April of this year of 75,000 euros, and that related to the failure to appropriately redact data before releasing to a third party. Um, there was also a fine of 40,000 euros issued to TUSA in respect of another data breach. Um, and that breach related to the release of a report containing allegations of abuse. Um, and that those allegations were um, disclosed to a third party and then made public on social media. So they are our first two fines in Ireland. And interestingly, they're against public bodies. I would say that in Ireland, um, fines can only be if, against public bodies is capped at one million. Two other inquiries um, that have concluded in Ireland, one is in relation to um, our police enforcement agency on Garda Shia Kona in Ireland. Uh, the DPC issued a reprimand and corrective action against Angarda Siakona in relation to a license plate recognition technology, access to CCTV monitoring rooms, general transparency obligations and the absence of written contracts with data processors. And then finally, the, on this page, the DPC also took enforcement action against the Department of Social Protection in relation to the national um, services card which we use to gain access to social services in Ireland. Um, so that was a high profile enforcement um, action in Ireland of late. Moving on to the next slide then. The DPC in addition to its enforcement role takes its role as a supervisor quite seriously as well. Prior to the GDPR um, the DPC didn't have any real enforcement action, so most of um, the action taken by the DPC was in respect of the supervisory role. Um, in the last two years, they have engaged significantly with a number of companies, which has resu resulted in the postponement or the revision of a number of big tech projects. And I've set out in that slide um, the action that has been taken by the DPC 
uh, on foot of those um, in engagements. So for example, you'll all have read about the Facebook dating app and that was postponed following an on-site inspection by the DPC. The Facebook election day reminder feature was also postponed throughout your pending engagement with the DPC. Um, Google location tracking, there was changes made to the location history and the web um, and app activity. Um, Microsoft, Google and Apple also made changes to their voice data processing and the transparency provisions around that. And then finally, um, LinkedIn ceased to display member to guest connection invitation screens on its platform. And the reason why I, I focused on these supervisory actions is that it really demonstrates that although the DPC in Ireland may not be at the forefront in terms of issuing fines, they are quite active in terms of the engagement they have with um, organisations within, um, within Ireland. So moving on to the next slide then. In terms of what to look out for in 2021, um, so cookies would be one key area. So in April of 2019, the Data Protection Commission commenced a cookie sweep and that examined cookie practices on websites across a number of industry sectors. On foot of that sweep then, the DPC issued a report and new guidance on the use of cookies in April of this year, so April 2020. And in that report, the DPC said that all organizations would have a six month grace period to get their house in order. And after that, you would start taking enforcement action um, in relation to um, cookie compliance. And that grace period ends on the 5th of October, 2020. So that's a date really to put into your diary to make sure that your cookie compliance is in order. Um, separately, on a slightly related point, e-privacy um, direct, direct marketing is going to be quite important um, for 2021. Um, and it's something that I always mention in the context of presenting to an EU group, because most EU privacy lawyers won't be aware that breach of the Irish e-privacy um, regulations, and in particular, the direct marketing provisions of the e-privacy regulations is actually a criminal offence in Ireland and breaches are prosecuted by the Data Protection Commission. Um, she will normally bring about four to five prosecutions per year. She'll normally uh, operate a two strike and you're out rule. So if you've had two breaches, she will buy, um, her, her modus operandi is to prosecute an organization on the third breach. Uh, the courts in Ireland have the ability to issue fines of up to 5,000 euros for breach of direct marketing. So it, it's be warned, um, make sure your direct marketing is in compliance with the I, Irish e-privacy regulation if you are engaging in direct marketing in Ireland. So I'm going to hand you over now to Francesca in Italy. Good afternoon, my name is Francesca Gravili. I'm the head of the data protection team in Italy. So if we can move to the first slide, I would like to stress, as you can see immediately, that our regulator is quite an aggressive regulator. It seems that uh, during the 2020 year, the total amount of fine was around 45 million. As you can see, the, here we can have the um, the slide and the vision on the most important fines of the last uh, eight months. Uh, the most important fine was emitted against Tim, which is, as you may know, a telephone operator as well as Wind and Iliad. Tim had a fine of more or less 28 million of euros. We had also an important fine against Any Gas Luce, which is an, an energy provider. Uh, what are, why these fines so important were emitted by the regulator? Because uh, after several instances presented by the consumer, the regulator found a lot of unlawful data processing relating to marketing, unsolicited marketing communication without consent, insensibility to let consumers exercise their rights. This is a very important point which has been stressed in all these decisions, in most of these decisions, let's say, inaccurate information notices, app 
implemented with a compulsory consent and various infringement affecting partners, agents and suppliers. So the chain that must be regulated, as you may know, uh, under Article 28 of our GDPR. And we had also some problems about employee for Iliad, for example, uh, and about the control of their activity uh, with the email. So we can say that we have this uh, wide uh, range of sanction because of the gravity of conduct. This is what our regulator say in his provision, because of the duration of the infringement. Uh, the inspection took a long time for this big operator, two or three years, and then the uh, regulator emitted this fine, and also taking in account the economic condition of, and the turnover, as you know, of these uh, important uh, players. Uh, if we can move now to the next slide, uh, we can also stress uh, um, taking some uh, data from the annual report of, of our regulator that uh, um, in uh, 2019, we have uh, we had uh, 32 administrative violations, 95 corrective measures, and nine notification to the judicial authority. Because the Italian Privacy Code, even if modified after GDPR, still provides for criminal sanctions. And as you see, when the regulator found um, this kind of uh, situation has he notified immediately to the criminal authority. Now these proceedings are still uh, pending. Um, I also want to stress another point, uh, considering what Tim said for Belgium at the beginning of this session, our regulator works with the financial police. So the inspection are really serious. Um, took more or less, they took more or less uh, two or three days and they are uh, managed on site. So this is a quite stressful um, session, I can say. And then you, you have the, the, the emission of the fine. Um, coming on the next slide and on the future, uh, we don't have uh, uh, an agenda updated because of the COVID emergency. So we can just uh, um, tell you what the Italian Data Protection Authority defined at the beginning of this uh, year. And um, as you can see, um, it seems to be concentrated on medical sector, pharmaceutical sector, online banking services, whistleblowing. And this is true because we had also uh, an experience on this case. So platform used for whistleblowing, uh, electronic invoicing, and coming on the next slide, because I don't think that you are interested in public sector. We also have, uh, for, of course, inspection uh, on marketing activities and in, on loyalty card. And also on this point, I have to focus the attention on food delivery sector. There are a lot of inspection on this field. So I think that my time is elapsed and now I can move and uh, introduce you my colleague, Eddie from Amsterdam office. Please, Eddie, go on. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um, well, nice to meet you. My name is Adi van Nieuwenhuizen and I'm a partner at the Field Fisher Amsterdam office, uh, specialized in tech, um, privacy, and a little bit of IP. Um, well, in the, 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 the Dutch Data Protection Authority, um, we only had the last two years um, four fines, so it's not that much. However, the fines that have been uh, supposed are quite high. Um, uh, the problem is, is that there are not that many fines, um, is that the Dutch uh, DPA is um, uh, quietly understaffed. Uh, they need more uh, employees, and everything everything well takes a lot of um, uh, time. For example, uh, when data subjects file a complaint with um, uh, the DPA, it uh, takes them uh, at least six months to take all these complaints. Uh, uh, into account so to, to 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 process so they are quite behind schedule that's what they are also uh, stating so the same applies for all these um, uh, uh, the fines uh, and the cases interesting is to see that um, we thought the DPA would 
go um, would have gone immediately after like the big tech giants or big corporations but that's not true uh, one of the fines was uh, uh, related to a hospital um, and the last uh, fine well one is it's not clear because it, there's still an appeal so we do not know which uh, company was fined but um, the Dutch Tennis Foundation also received a fine. So it's not uh, as a company that you can kind of hide uh, behind the fact that you're a low key player or uh, that you would expect that, well, really the, the, the big companies would, uh, would, would, uh, would be the first in line to, um, uh, to get a fine. And with respect to this understaffed problem, the same applies for the data breaches. So everything, um, yeah, it takes, takes a while also the investment Investigations. The Dutch DPA is um, is 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 um, running. Um, so I think the next slide. So that those are the other uh, yes, the other um, cases. Um, the Dutch DPA. Uh, well, they have official um, official area uh, of focus. It's for 20, 2023. Those are not included in the slides, but that's the the trade on data. They are now uh, focusing on uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms and uh, the digital government. But what they are now doing, especially now uh, with respect to the COVID, is um, they were well they 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 published guidance uh, on all the uh, Corona COVID questions, especially with uh, temperature checks, how to deal with employees. Uh, they provide a lot of uh, advice with respect to the coronavirus app um, they still have um, they still advise the advising against us so the government is not really happy with that and they are now running an inf investigation on TikTok and they are still now focusing on enforcement they said two years ago um, well when the GDPR was well entered into force that the first year first two years was more um, related to guidance and the implementation of GDPR and now it's really more on the enforcement part although there are not that much uh, fines um, and to conclude uh, what is quite interesting now and that's not um, uh, a GDPR fine but we have now a first mass claim that um, uh, was uh, filed last uh, July and it's initi initiated by a Dutch foundation against Oracle and um, uh, tech sales and um, uh, it's um, we have a new mass claim act and um, uh, before this act it was difficult as individual to get real damages but now with this new act um, individuals uh, who are member of the foundation can uh, claim 500 euros per uh, per person for um, uh, as a compensation for a privacy infringement damages so the the writ of summons has been uh, filed um, uh, it's published because it's published in a register it's a over 200 pages a uh, long one so uh, and it's really interesting to see because this is the first class action on the, on the GDPR uh, how this will uh, will end up the we expect that the other side will and this is so this is not in front if before the, the DPA but uh, just at the, in the civil court uh, so before a, well, a regular judge uh, and we have to see the, the other side will have to file their statement of defense somewhere in January, February uh, 2021 and, and then there will be a hearing. So we do not expect a judgment before next summer, but it's really interesting um, um, to see. Um, well, this was it for the Netherlands and I will turn on to Spain to my colleague Nuria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidy, and um, good afternoon, everybody. So, by by way of uh, by way of a quick introduction, I I am uh, Nuria Pastor, a director at the Privacy Team based in London. So today I'll be covering both the UK and Spain, as I am uh, duly qualified in in England and Spain. So, um, without further ado, I'll provide some um, highlights about the Spanish um, DPA's activity. So earlier this summer, uh, this summer the, at the beginning of the summer, the Spanish DPA issued its annual report for its 2019 activity. 
So the figures I'm going to provide today um, focus on, on the activity in 2019. As not all the decisions are made public, I won't be able to provide st stats for 2020. So some of the things that the Spanish DPA highlights uh, from, its, from its activity in 2019 are, for example, the creation of a new internal technical unit in order to have a better understanding of the technology that it has to um, take into account when carrying out enforcement activities. The technical unit is also involved in the assessment of personal data breaches. The report also highlights the Spanish that the Spanish DPA continues to focus on the protection of privacy um, of the privacy rights of children and indeed the Spanish DPA has issued extensive guidance in the last few years on, on this uh, matter so it's really a hot topic for them. So however for me what's really interesting um, in the report is that the report highlights a, a cultural what we could call a bit of a cultural um, shift um, that the Spanish DPA as a regulator has undergone in the past few years. So those of you who have worked on data protection for a few years will remember that the Spanish DPA had a bit of a bad reputation of being a tough um, regulator and that it would issue thousands of, fi of fines per year. So uh, pre-GDPR, the Spanish DPA had the power to issue fines up, up to 900,000 euros, which was a high ceiling if you compare it with the powers of other European regulators. So for example, as Tim was saying, some um, European regulators had no teeth whatsoever pre-GDPR, but the Spanish um, regulator did. Um, however, in the recent years, the Spanish DPA is doing um, more to promote compliance and prevent having to take enforcement action. So if we can go to the next slide, please, thanks. So in order to do this, the Spanish DPA has carried out a number of initiatives described in this slide. So for example, a mediation scheme with auto control, which is a, an industry body, in order to deal with complaints about identity fraud and unsolicited marketing. The Spanish DPA is also promoting uh, actively the use of the do not contact um, Robinson list as a way of reducing the number of complaints that reach it. Last but not least, the Spanish DPA has set out an arbitration procedure whereby the Spanish DPA, upon receiving a complaint, will refer the complaint back to the relevant controller or processor or their DPOs if they are in place in order to encourage a satisfactory solution between the individual and the organization and try to avoid starting formal proceedings. So the conclusion in my perspective, is that organizations getting it wrong are now more likely to have a chance to get it right now um, than, they, than they did a few years ago before they are subject to enforcement actions. So I'll now move on to consider what triggers enforcement activities in Spain. And as you can see, I won't go through the slide in detail, but as you can see quite clearly in this slide, what enforcement activity normally does not originate from proactive actions of the Spanish DPA. In fact, only 15 um, cases were, were brought actively by, by them. So let's move on to um, looking at the audit um, activities. Um, so the report highlights that there is a new audit unit that was put in place in 2019. So this unit will obviously carry out audits. Sometimes it will um, do uh, sector specific audits. And in 2019, um, they focused on the distant selling sector, health services and law enforcement bodies. Um, the, um, the audit team would also carry out investigations linked to security breaches and audits um, with other regulators under Article um, 62 of the GDPR. So let's move on now to the decisions, which is um, obviously very interesting for the topic we're covering today. So in 2019, the Spanish DPA issued 5,300 decisions, including fines and warnings and other types of decisions. Significantly though, out of these, 2,598, so more than half of these, were referred back, were a decision to refer back the, the case to the controller or the DPO under the arbitration procedure um, I explained earlier, and resolved without further involvement of the Spanish EPA. So when we consider the enforcement decisions as such, we can see that there were 338 
decisions, including 112 fines, 139 warnings, and 87 cases which were archived. The amount of the fines were over 6 million in total. So if we work out an average, as I did, um, you, you have an average of about 56,000 um, euros per fine. I know this is only an average, but it seems clear that the Spanish DPA, if you compare um, these um, sort of figures with information that some of my colleagues, maybe in France or Germany have provided, or indeed in Italy, it's clear that um, the Spanish DPA is not issuing mega fines yet, and it's not um, it's quantifying the fines in, in a different way that some other European regulators are. So here I provide the figure for um, 2018, and we can see um, these are significant in the sense that, as you can see, the number of fines has decreased significantly. In the report, the Spanish DPA has explicitly said that the reason why the number of fines has reduced so significantly is because the GDPR regime allows that controllers and DPOs are more active and that facilitates that many claims might be resolved by them. Also that the GDPR allows for the issue of warnings, which the Spanish DPA, as you have seen, is doing especially for small organizations and private individuals. And also one of the reasons why um, there are less, uh, fewer fines is because the Spanish DPA is taking some time uh, because of resourcing issues to investigate certain matters. So obviously they, they do say they have um, a lot of cases in the pipeline. Let's have a look at the sectors then. So I won't go through them in, in detail, but um, I thought it was interesting to have a look at the list of, of sectors that have been subject to enforcement action. And obviously you can see that video, surveil video surveillance, um, the internet and marketing are the top three sectors that have been affected. Uh, it's probably not, not a surprise. Let's move on um, onto the next slide, please. please. And um, so we're going to look at the enforcement um, and what attracts a fine in Spain. So there are no stats on this um, in the report. And as I said earlier, not all cases or decisions are made public. But the Spanish DPA in the report provides some highlights of the most relevant cases in 2019. So from these highlights, we can see that the following areas continue to be areas of focus. So they have been focusing on security breaches, the use of technologies such as app and the privacy challenges that this um, triggers. Also, um, they have actually um, issued quite high fines in relation to fraudulent marketing to vulnerable individuals and then, and then the usual sort of suspects in terms of um, um, infringements relating to cookie consent, to privacy notice, video surveillance, and the processing and sharing of health data. Uh, before I move on to the UK section, I wanted to highlight in relation to cookies that the Spanish DPA has updated very recently its cookie guidance, and it has introduced significant changes. There is a six months um, grace period to, um, to amend um, the cookie rule practices in Spain. So I'm obviously not able to go through this in detail now, but if you, have, if you operate in, in Spain and have any questions about this, obviously um, let me know and I'll be happy to, to discuss this with you. So we'll now move on, I'll change my hat. So I'll put on my solicitor's hat and I would like to discuss with you the ICO's um, enforcement activities. So similarly to what happened in Spain, so in July 2020, the ICO presented its annual report before Parliament. The report provides highlights about the ICO's performance of the last year, including its enforcement activities and areas of, focusing, of focus going forward. As you can see here, the ICO identifies six areas of achievement, which um, I highlight in this slide. Um, because we're go quite tight on time, I, um, you can see that in, in your own time. Um, these are the areas that the ICO is highlighting, but I'm going to ask um, Chloe, please, if we could go um, to the next slide. Thank you very much. So in terms of the, I'll now move on to discuss the regulatory activity in, in, um, in some detail. So over the past 12 months, the ICO um, took regulatory action 
um, 236 times and conducted 2,100 investigations. You can see the figures in the slide, but what I would like to highlight is who is at the receiving end of these regulatory actions and what type, what type of infringements are attracting this regulatory activity. So the report highlights that the sectors generating most complaints include local government, health, internet, lenders, retail, policing and criminal records. The reasons for the complaints include subject access requests, right to prevent the processing of data, data sharing issues, security and fair processing um, um, infringements and data retention issues as well. With regards to data breaches, um, the ICO reports that they have increased significantly and they've, they received just under 13,000 um, reports. Um, and the five sectors generating more data breaches are health, general business, education, finance, and local government. In the report, you, if you take a look, you can see that the ICO highlights um, some of the actions that it has taken. I will, um, including, for example, enforcement and enforcement notice against HMRC. Um, what I would like to highlight in relation to this is that is the um, the most as the most significant cases are the the major data breaches of British Airways and um, and Marriott. You will remember that in the summer of 2019, the ICO announced its intention to fine BA and Marriott uh, very high fines, uh, respectively. These were put on hold as many other ICOs activities due to the COVID-19 pandemic and obviously because there are, there are um, doings and throwings between, between the ICO and these organizations. And we haven't had the final fines yet. I, I think that they're probably going to be significantly lower than the figures initially announced. So for now, um, the ICO, again, similarly to the Data Protection Authority in Spain, is not yet issuing mega fines um, like other European countries, as we've seen in these presentations. And the next slide highlights um, the areas where the ICO is, that the ICO is going to focus on in the next few years. And as you can see, there are no surprises here. Brexit is one of them, and the ICO will continue to provide advice to the UK government on new approaches to continued regulatory cooperation between the UK and the EU, and to define the ICO's role in the adequacy process. But I'll stop here because we're running out of time, and I'll hand over to Hazel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nuria, and thank you to the rest of our speakers. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed this quick canter through the eight major European jurisdictions. Uh, I certainly have. We've picked up a, a few questions along the way. Um, I think we've answered most of those questions. I certainly hope we have. Uh, there's been a very recent question about the slides and yes after today we will send everybody a copy of the recording uh, a copy of the slides and also some links to some useful information from the privacy team I think what's interesting from today's uh, session is that we're so seeing a real build-up of enforcement throughout the EU and some interesting trends in terms of the different sectors and the types of information or activities that are gaining interest from the regulators, whether it's cookies or the healthcare sector or direct marketing. Uh, we've come a long way from just enforcing breaches, uh, as in security breaches, uh, it certainly seems to me. I think that uh, you will find that uh, there are many things that you could be doing to prevent some of these enforcements, and I'm hoping that you might join us for one of our next uh, webinars where we will focus on accountability. Um, Martin McElroy, who is the Data Protection Officer for Field Fisher, uh, will be joined by one of our other partners, Renzo Martini, who will talk about accountability on the 24th of September at 3 p.m. So I think accountability might be one of the great things that you could be looking at in order to prepare your business for the inevitable enforcements that seem to be round the door. So as we're so very close to time, I'm going to sum up and finish now. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope this has helped you with some of your questions about enforcement and enforcement trends. If there are some questions that have come through that we haven't had time to deal with, we will answer those in writing and we will send through the slides and a recording uh, very soon. Thank you all and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>